All right, so now let's talk about nucleic acids. Again, this is what we get when we link our nucleotides together. Um, so first of all, let's look at what this looks like. How do we link nucleotides together? Notice that we're going to link it from the three, uh, carbon three of our sugar, and that's going to be linked to the phosphate group of an adjacent nucleotide. So I have my one here. I have my other one down here. And again, now they're going to be linked together um, by that phosphate group. All right, this is what we would call a phosphodiester linkage. All right, so the uh, sugar, uh, carbon three of one sugar is linked to carbon five of another sugar through a phosphodiester linkage. Notice that that also means that at one end, you have a free five prime phosphate. Why is it five prime? Because that's what carbon the phosphate group is bound to. And on the other end, you have a free three prime hydroxyl, okay? Um, this is the way that we read DNA structures is from five prime end to three prime, rather like we talk about the sequence. So adenine, guadenine, cytosine, adenine, whatever the, the specific identity of that nucleic acid is, you always talk about it from five prime to three prime. And what is five prime? It's that free five prime end that um, carbon number five that has that free phosphate group. And what's the three prime end? It's carbon number three of the sugar that has a free hydroxyl group, okay? Um, yeah, this is what we would, that's what we would call the uh, primary structure of a nucleic acid, right? So the sequence A, T, G, G, C, T, A, whatever, whatever its identity is, that would be the primary structure. Just like for proteins, when we were talking about primary structure, it's what is the order that the amino acids are linked in. And remember with amino acids, we had this convention of always going from, of always reading it from the free N terminus to the free C terminus. Same thing here, five prime to three prime. Okay, um, so again, we have one as our five prime end because it has that free five prime phosphate. The other one is the three prime end because it has that free three prime hydroxyl group. And all these different nucleotides are linked together through the phosphodiester linkage. That's what links the ribose of one or the deoxyribose, depending on what whether it's DNA or RNA, what links the sugar of one nucleotide to the sugar of another nucleotide, okay? So the primary sequence for this one here would be A, C, G, T, or A, C, G, U, depending on whether I was talking about DNA or RNA. Um, again, because we're gonna read it from five prime to three prime, okay? Um, we're going to see this care. So this carries genetic information, right? We said that these DNAs, they code for proteins. We'll see exactly what we mean by uh, from that by the end of this chapter. We're sort of going to build uh, talking about just structure of nucleic acids and then about how DNA is replicated, transcribed and RNA is translated. OK. Um, this is just now and a less cartoonish picture of what was just shown before, where you can actually see these phosphodiester linkages, what exactly they look like. Okay, and then you have the base identity as well. That's what differentiates these nucleotides, right? So your different strands of DNA will differ in the exact organization of the different nucleotides. So one might be ACGU, Whereas the other one is ACCGT, so, or I guess uh, that would be mixing DNA and RNA, AAGCCU, something like that. So uh, the order that these things are put in those are how the cell knows what protein to make. And again, we'll talk about exactly how that is in a, in a bit. All right, uh, structure of DNA in particular. Okay, so first of all, DNA, as you might have known, is organized as a double helix. So there's actually two strands of DNA 
that are um, linked together, kind of intertwined with one another. One strand would run from the five prime end to the three prime end. The other one is going in the opposite direction. Okay, so the other one has three prime to five prime. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the structure of DNA. First of all, two main, two important things. First of all, uh, this is a molecule of DNA. This is using a very cool program called PyMol that I used a lot during my research. But so this is an actual, uh, what's called a crystal structure of DNA, or somebody used this fancy technique called, called X-ray crystallography to image what an actual strand of DNA looks like. This isn't something that was generated by a computer. This comes from an actual strand that was taken from, I don't know what species, but some species. So let's look for here. So first of all, we can see our two strands. Um, important structurally, first of all, notice that each strand or the base, the bases along one strand are like stacked on top of each other, right? These strands aren't crooked sideways. They're like plates stacked on top of each other. The flat ends are stacked on top of each other within a strand. Right, so if I kind of tilt this around, you can see that these different ring structures, which are all very flat, are stacked one on top of each other. This is what's called base stacking. Okay, the other thing that's important is that each base on one strand is paired up with a base on another strand. Okay, so these are two structural, two important features. Um, it turns out that the pairs are always the same. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. So the concentration of adenine in your DNA is the same as thymine. There's a one-to-one -one ratio. Same with guanine and cytosine. Number of cytosines always equal um, the number of guanines and the number of adenines always equal the number of thymines. Okay, um, let's like, so let's just take a look. A and T, if we go to our constants page, notice that adenine is a purine, whereas thymine is a pyrimidine. Just same thing with G and C, All right? So for both of these pairs, one of them is the pyrimidine and one of them is a purine, All right, That's what keeps DNA spaced the same. Right, it's not like some portions of this double-stranded helix are skinny and other ones are fat. They're both consist of both a purine and a pyrimidine, which keeps the spacing of those two strands constant. Um, okay, so actually, don't look. I meant to do this. All right. So if we look at the concentration or the percent of adenine and thymine, again, they're always gonna be the same because adenine and thymine are always paired with one another in those two strands. Same thing as guanine and cytosine, right? These two are going to be the same as well. And of course they should all add up to a hundred, right? Um, so because of that, we could, if I just told you the percentage of one of them, so for example, salmon is the 28% uh, adenine, you would be able to solve for the rest of them because you would know that thymine is the same because every thymine is paired with an adenine. And then everything else has to be uh, guanine and cytosine. Okay, so that would mean that it has to be 22% guanine and cytosine. Right, so you want to be able to convince yourself that given just one of these numbers, so for example, 23% cytosine, you can figure out the other ones. So that means that it's 23% guanine. These together would be 46. So that leaves 54% left. I divide that by two, and that's how I would get the 27% for the other two components, right? Because 54 divided by two is 27. Okay, so make sure that you can, it's not really complicated math, but make sure that you sort of understand why that would be. All of these have to add up to 100. And if I know, um, for example, adenine, I know that the thymine has to be equal and that everything else is the other two components. Okay, so why are they always paired like that? Um, this is, we call these two base pairs and they're complementary. 
right? So adenine and thymine are complementary because of hydrogen bonding. So adenine has a hydrogen bond donor in the exact place that thymine has a hydrogen bond acceptor and vice versa. Adenine has a hydrogen bond acceptor in the exact place that thymine has a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, so hydrogen bonding is what's keeping these bases paired. And it's this perfect kind of jigsaw puzzly piecing fit sort of thing where one has a, do uh, an, a hydrogen, don hydrogen bond donor in the same place that the other has a hydrogen bond acceptor. And it's the same thing with the GC base pairing. Guadagnine has hydrogen bond acceptors in the exact place that cytosine has a hydrogen bond donor. And guanine has hydrogen bond donors in the exact place that cytosine has hydrogen bond acceptors. Okay, so again, complementary base pairing is what explains why guanine is always paired with cytosine and why adenine is always paired with threonine. And importantly, these base pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds. Uh, what you would have noticed is that our AT uh, base pairs have two hydrogen bonds. Whereas our GC base pairs have three hydrogen bonds. I'm not going to be expecting you to be able to, um, yeah, it'd be great if you could, but it, not something that I'm going to ask to have you draw these base pairs, but you do need to know that adenine has two and guanine has three. Okay, that is just one of those fun facts that the ACS exam is going to ask you about. Okay, and then the backbone of the strands are again those phosphodiester linkages between the sugars, right? So alternating sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. This is what makes up what we call the backbone. So I guess if I just go to my fancy program again, you can see that along the outside here, the backbone are those orange phosphate groups and then those five membered rings, those are the sugars. As I spin around, you can see that it just alternates sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And then we have these bases that are within a strand that are stacked on top of each other. And then the two strands are held together by base pairing, which is that hydrogen bonding between complementary bases. All right, so if I give you a strand of DNA, the primary sequence, you should be able to tell me what the corresponding um, strand would be, all right? So A pairs with T, G pairs with C, T, A, G, G, T, T, A, G. Really not too complicated. You just have to remember who's paired with who, okay? The other important thing to remember is that on that complementary strand, it's running the other direction from three prime to five prime. 